morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the, oh, one more person coming in. Welcome to the 2023-2024 Community Health Nurses of Canada Professional Development Webinar Series. We are honored to have our guest speaker with us today, Don Tisdale. And Don will be talking to us about adopting Indigenous cultural safety, humility, and anti-racism into community health nursing. My name is Donna Jepson. I am the current president of the Community Health Nurses of Canada. And again, welcome to everyone. I'm calling in this morning from uh, my, my home of Gibsons. I have a foot in Vancouver and a foot in Gibson. So today I would like to recognize the traditional territory of the Squamish nation. And I would like to invite others, if you would like to also acknowledge the traditional territory upon which you're calling in from today, please feel free to add that to the chat. We always look forward to reading uh, where other people in Canada are calling in from. Uh, this is a special day. I want to recognize Indigenous uh, Nurses Day today, April 10th, 2023. That day changes every day uh, or every year, sorry. So um, a special welcome to Indigenous nurses that are joining us today. Uh, it's also Easter Monday. It is Passover and Ramadan. So this is a, a special day and thank you for uh, being here today. I would also like to thank the First Nations Health Authority who have generously supported this session today and enabled us to have Don Tisdale as our speaker. We just wanted to tell you a little bit about what a CHNC is. We're a nonprofit organization. We're about 36 years old. We're a volunteer board of community health nurses from every province and territory. We're currently recruiting a director from Nunavut and British Columbia, and there will be a few other positions available uh, come June 2023. We have a part-time underpaid overworked uh, executive director who's with us today, uh, Anthony Lombardo. We have 10 very active standing committees with about 339 members in Canada. And I think we also, we do have uh, students, nursing students, and I believe our nursing students are in addition to 339. So some of the work that we do, uh, before my time on the board, there were board members and others that worked on the Canadian Community Health Nurses Professional Practice Model and Standards, and those are published in some community health nursing textbooks in Canada. Uh, Karen Curry, who is the president-elect, has been gathering a group of community health nurses to update the competencies for community health nursing, um, specifically the home care competencies. And we also need to look at updating the public health nursing competencies. We have a biannual face-to-face -face conference coming in 2024, and a webinar series was started in 2022. We will be uh, giving out awards of merit at our AGM in June. And we have a bursary for community health nurses who want to sit the certification exam with CNA. So there's a $500 bursary available. So why, why join us? Um, this is an opportunity to network with nursing colleagues across the country. We have a great big news newsletter uh, we have reduced registration fees for our conferences, and we do try to provide educational opportunities. Uh, one of our goals is, is to advance community health nursing uh, in Canada. It is also an opportunity to sit on national committees. Um, we, the community health nurses uh, of Canada is often consulted by uh, an organization such as the Canadian Nurses Association, to consult on various uh, topics. And we try to contribute to healthy public policy uh, in Canada. So being a member of CHNC is an opportunity to attend, vote and be elected to CHNC and gain continuous uh, learning hours. We would love you to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram or, or LinkedIn and stay in touch with us and you'll hear about more opportunities in Canada. So the three overall objectives of, of CHNC are to advance the health of people in Canada, 
We want to strengthen as a cent uh, center of excellence in community health nursing and also build and sustain an effective organization, which is not always easy uh, during a pandemic. But I believe that with the commitment of our volunteer board and our executive director, we've been able to maintain our organization. So Dawn, I'd love to turn it over uh, to you now and, and for me to stop talking. So um, I want to introduce our guest speaker for the session today and the next session, which is on May 10th. Uh, Dawn is a registered nurse of mixed Mi'kmaq and European ancestry and is the Indigenous Senior Professional Practice Lead for uh, BC Children and Women's Hospitals, which uh, are in Vancouver, in the Indigenous Health Program. Dawn is responsible for uh, organizational Indigenous cultural safety policy, innovation, education, and research with a focus on children and women's health in our province. Dawn's leadership experience in nursing and healthcare policy has focused on supporting the rights of Indigenous-led healthcare to create culturally safe systems. Dawn previously served as a lead with the Sanya's Indigenous Cultural Safety Training Program and with the Association of Registered Nurses of BC as their professional development lead. Uh, her health career began in community support work and as a registered nurse in medicine, palliative care and health policy. Dawn also works with nursing schools across the country to implement Indigenous cultural safety into nursing practice and pedagogy. Dawn's research and advocacy efforts, uh, efforts sorry, are grounded in disrupting anti-Indigenous racism in support of health equity to improve access and services for Indigenous peoples. Most importantly, she is committed to health-centered leadership to support systems change. Welcome, Dawn. I'm gonna stop sharing and get off camera. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning. I hope everybody has, my coffee's not warm anymore, but has some, uh, some nice warm coffee and um, thanks for taking the time this morning to hold space on National Indigenous Nurses Day to have these, you know, really important conversations and I just want to thank your association also for um, inviting this, uh, inviting me and holding this and hosting the um, this webinar series. And uh, I also just want to take time to thank um, Barbara, Donna, Anthony, Morag, Barbara and Karen and, and everyone else within the team um, for all the support. It's just been so well organized. I was just um, raving about what a lovely organization you have and just how uh, welcoming and supporting it's been. So thanks and my gratitude to everybody. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Got all this lovely tech support as well this morning. So it should, oh, maybe I won't say it will go on without a hitch, without knocking on some wood. <laughs> um, can everybody see? Can I just maybe get a... Just yes, a, we can see your screen. Oh, okay. oh, perfect. Thank you. Lovely. Thanks, Barbara. Um, so, yes, yeah, so today um, we're just going to be doing a um, bit of an overview of um, what some of the impacts of... Um, anti-Indigenous racism within healthcare, um, going over concepts of what cultural safety, cultural humility, and what does adopting anti-Indigenous racism into community health nursing look like? Okay, <laughs> that took a, a couple of uh, uh, tries before that worked. Um, so really going over, um, just so doing the introductions, thanks so much, Donna, for the lovely introduction. And also, um, yeah, thanks for also encouraging folks to just, you know, say who they are and where they're visiting from. Uh, love Zoom, because I could see the little pop-ups. I've got a lot going on on my screen, but I could see the little pop-ups from, from the chat. And oh my gosh, so many folks across um, Turtle Island. Um, I didn't see everybody's name, but I also saw Nora White. So I just want to say hi. Um, and uh, lots of uh, folks joining in, so so wonderful. And and I was I was saying to Donna before we started, you know, um, 
how um, we talk about Indigenous cultural safety um, from province to province, which we'll talk more about today, really varies. So um, we're going over some, you know, pretty foundational con concepts today, just to ensure that everybody has that baseline of understanding, because um, as we all know, you know, how we were or were not taught about some of the um, colonial impacts of, of um, colonization and, and what Indigenous health means and looks like within, you know, a broader Canadian landscape very significantly. So um, again, taking that opportunity to just build some of that foundation today. And then, of course, going over cultural safety and uh, more importantly, uh, the tremendous role an agency nursing has in promoting Indigenous cultural safety within our healthcare system and within nursing. Um, so just by way of introduction and just following um, protocol um, and elders teachings and uh, protocols, basically from, from uh, I, I think we could safely say all um, nations across Turtle Island, um, we always want to introduce ourselves and not only introduce ourselves, but also introduce ourselves in a way that what is our connection to the land. Um, and these protocols are done um, out of respect and also um, as a way to build a relationship with one another. So the way um, uh, Elder Jerry Ullman explains it to me is that, you know, I wouldn't come to someone's house, right? And, and just enter and come in without saying who I am, why I'm here and, um, and, and starting that relationship and building that with one another. So it's just such a foundational piece. So when we think about not only, um, um, when we're doing, you know, territory and land acknowledgements, but also who we are in relationship to the land. So I'll start off just um, for doing that myself. So by way of introduction, um, I'm of, of mixed European and um, Mi'kmaq ancestry. So on my father's side, settler, white Ukrainian um, ancestry. And on my mother's um, French, Irish, um, Acadian from the East Coast. And um, my Roy family, um, who was Acadian on my grandmother's side. So my grandmother was born in Bad River Reserve in what's colonially known as Wisconsin. Um, but um, how our ancestry is through Wabanaki Confederacy and of Mi'kmaq ancestry with some Anishinaabe as well. Um, lots of severance and disruption um, in our relationship, even with our own family based on um, colonial and assimilative policies, my grandmother being an Indigenous woman, um, and with um, lots of assimilation policies targeting Indigenous women in particular within, within the Indian Act, with this, which is still, of course, current um, legislation still within Canada. Um, lots of um, disruption and, and she died when she was quite young and um, so where I'm in the process and have been over the past several decades of really reclaiming what that means for my family um, and I and doing a lot of healing and I think you know I, I share that because I think a lot of folks um, are in that place at this particular um, time and era um, but also of course with my settler ancestry as well and what that that means for myself um, and the complexities of that identity um, within the Canadian state. So I think um, I just want to encourage everybody to um, also, you know, reflect on, on your own social locations and who you are and where you come from and what that relationship is to this land. Um, I think um, Donna's lovely introduction, thanks so much, um, covered a lot of my, you know, professional background, but I'm just really interested in, in nursing's role in um, creating safer systems for Indigenous people to access care and uh, the colonial system that, that we currently have and what nursing's relationship has been within that colonial system is a really complex one. And I think, you know, when, when I consider this question, I also consider this question broadly also to our profession at large and, and what that means and how we have, um, one, been um, a helper 
and um, and and a profession that offers care and support and um, all that clinical expertise and and all all the beauty and and awesomeness that is nursing that I love so much and also how we have also been complicit within a system that has also enacted a lot of these harms and how the healthcare system in particular has been used um, to assimilate and disrupt um, uh, Indigenous peoples' lives within, um, within Canada. Um, oh, and I also, sorry, want to say, I should say as well for, for, for um, my own land acknowledgement, I missed that part, I covered the ancestry, um, but I also, so I grew up on Mohawk territory, which is colonially known as Montreal, and I'm currently an uninvited guest on unceded and occupied traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, so Musqueam, Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Stolo Nation specifically, um, what's colonially known as Vancouver, and um, I have uh, been with BC Women's and Children's for six months, and it's really exciting times, especially in BC, and we'll, we'll go over some of um, the, the more political shifts that have happened in our province, but also just getting a, a pulse um, on, on different locations across Canada as to how we are um, adopting cultural safety within our healthcare system. And uh, I'm really fortunate BC Women's and Children's has done a, a tremendous job at uh, developing team very specifically to support these efforts so um think I just want to do a shout out to them as well and also um yeah as a way to model and, and again we'll talk about that uh, that as well but what what that can look like for all of us in practice for different departments and organizations and what's really required um, so I just also um as part of protocol but also in recognition of um our topic today, I just want to um, give gratitude and thank um, the matriarchs and Indigenous nurse leaders, especially um, this day uh, in particular, oh, I get emotional, um, on the shoulders that I stand that have, you know, worked really um, uh, tirelessly um, through self-sacrifice in their professional practice to advance um, Indigenous nursing in, in such a way that I'm able to hold these conversations today with everyone because, um, you know, I think it's important to recognize, you know, not five or ten years ago, some of the lots of these conversations weren't even happening. And um, it's no, um, it, it's not by magic that, that we're holding space for these conversations today. And I think in particular, when we look um, broadly at Indigenous advocacy, Indigenous nurses have been at the forefront of that work, particularly within healthcare. So um, this is one of my elders um, who is a nurse, a registered psychiatric nurse, um, Elder Gwen Campbell MacArthur. And uh, this is her on her homeland um, offering blessings. And I just want to, um, I always, um, honor. Um, I love this picture so much. And I think it starts us off in a good way today for all of us. And, um, you know, I just for intention setting for today's session and, and for for um, May 10th um, session, that um, I, I really want to come in a way that we can, you know, um, bring nursing together and hopefully um, shift some of our thinking, open our hearts and minds to improving, you know, um, healthcare that has long been very harmful um, and for, for Indigenous people trying to access care and to shed some light on the current state. Um, but that um, you know, in these really hard conversations that we open ourselves to some discomfort that can come up, um, some vulnerability, but also that it's um, an invitation and a welcoming in instead of calling out. And, you know, some of the conversation that we'll be having, you know, is, is, um, can feel um, really heavy and, and even harsh, um, I think, at times. But um, I think, I, again, just speaking on some of um, elder teachings is, you know, you can't say goodbye to a problem until you first say hello. And that's Elder Jerry Ullman. Again, um, I, I quote him a lot. Um, so I think what we're doing today is, is really taking pause and examining what some of the key issues are um, within community health nursing. Um, and how we can yeah come together to to do better
I also, um, sorry, just want to pause also and just thank um, Elder Evelyn Voyager too, um, who really um, helped supported me um, in the beginning of my journey. And it's just really important to offer recognition to our elders. So um, in addition to Elder Gwen here, I just want to thank Elder Evelyn. So when we think about Indigenous health, um, I always want to start every conversation off by disrupting, I think, the idea that um, in these conversations, often we talk about Indigenous health um, um, issues. And I think right off the bat, sometimes that um, misguides us into thinking that there is a problem with Indigenous people's health or pathologizing um, Indigenous peoples unintentionally through that kind of language. And it's really important while we're going to, again, today be talking about um, some of the really significant harmful experiences within healthcare um, that the issues do not lie in Indigenous people's health. And in fact, the opposite is true. We know from uh, oral histories that, you know, um, since time immemorial, Indigenous peoples' um, worldviews have contributed to these really rich and healthy lifestyles. Um, we just recently had a, a knowledge keeper uh, um, come and do an unveiling at Women's and Children's, and, and uh, he was from Musqueam Territory, and he was talking about how um, common it was um, you know, when he was listening to his elders, how common it was for people to, um, along the coast, to live into their centennial year, um, and just such um, healthy, strong nations and peoples. And um, so when, when we look at that, it also offers us the opportunity to look at what is the issue. And when, you know, other um, societies, especially, you know, within Europe at the time, um, in, in, you know, the last, you know, few hundred years, where health um, was much more challenged and life expectancy was much short, that idea, again, disrupting that kind of thought that, you know, it's Western medicine that, you know, has come to save the day, um, that, that just simply simply isn't true. Um, and that's, again, not to say that there's not parts of Western medicine that are not incredibly valuable. But when we look at overall health and holistic health practices, um, people of Turtle Island have had um, these practices tried, tested, and trued in all of what would be considered that scientific knowledge within a Western uh, worldview. And so when we're looking at what the real issue is, um, isn't of course Indigenous people's health, but really it's the impact of colonization and the implementation of assimilative policies and how that disruption in all structures have resulted in overwhelming health inequities for Indigenous people in Canada, that that is, that is where the, the glaring health issues come from. So um, we don't obviously have time today to go over what all of these systems, you know, look like and how they were implemented. Um, but it is important to have a bit of an overview to better understand what that looked like. And, you know, uh, these, this list is certainly not um, like all um, encompassing, um, but these are some of like the very, um, uh, deliberate tactics that were used um, within Canadian government since contact to really, and the intention really was um, annihilation um, and genocide, but um, because that didn't work and because um, Indigenous people were so strong and healthy and, and so many in Canada, um, the, the default then um, became assimilation as well when, when annihilation wasn't possible. So starting right off um, at the very intent um, of, of contact was the doctrine of discovery. And that's been in the news a lot in this past week, um, 2023, my goodness, um, just the Catholic Church just acknowledging that um, the doctrine of discovery um, was faulty. Um, it was interesting watching some of the language as it came up in the news this week. Um, and I was reflecting on just how important language is. 
And when we look at like an acknowledgement and, and, a, and an apology even, and the implications of what the doctrine of discovery and the basis for colonization within um, all of, you know, uh, what's, what's commonly known as North America, um, is just incredible. And so that doctrine of discovery really, so it was developed by Europeans at the time uh, with uh, church and state to basically sanction and say, um, and, and this is also where concepts, which are socially constructed concepts of race were developed, basically saying that white people were superior race. This was I'm using my quotations in case people can't see me, um, scientifically proven, which of course has been, you know, long debunked. There is no such thing as, as race. Well, there is, there's one human race, um, but that differentiation, um, I don't know if that's a word, but that, that, um, that, that, uh, um, segregated um, race based on color um, really was not true. And so one of the ways that they could validate or, or used um, that to validate colonization was to say that, that you know, white people were support, superior and that the doctrine of discovery really saw that, um, that unless it was an uh, occupied territory by another, you know, white, uh, you know, uh, European government, that basically um, the indigenous people or the peoples of those lands were viewed as the equivalent of, you um, um, animals and plants. Um, what it, and this is just right within the doctrine of discovery. So, um, so, and I think to many people's surprise, um, you know, it's not, you know, well taught, but the doctrine of discovery still holds a lot of political power, both in America and in Canada to this day. Um, so it, it can't be understated the importance of, again, the advocacy work around um, uh, the elimination of the doctor doctrine of discovery and, and the outright banishment of it. Um, the Indian Act, so one of the um, last race-based legislations that exist on planet Earth um, exists within Canada. And so um, it is still alive, it is still uh, implemented, it is still, um, you know, people are issued a number and a card if they are status Indian. And that um, really dictates how, especially when we look at healthcare services, how they can or cannot access those healthcare services. Um, the reserve system was implemented. Um, you know, what when, when we look at um, the reserve system from contact, which, um, you know, was, uh, you know, based a lot on, on this, this next one day, you know, the treaty negotiations um, is now, you know, um, moved down to uh, less than 2% of what the original agreements were within Canada. Um, and again, a way to segregate and and um, and invisibilize um, and and uh, indigenous people, and it's also really important and noteworthy as well that you know a lot of the countries that Canada. Um, looks down upon or, or superior to uh, when it comes to like, you know, apartheid in, in Africa or, you know, some of the atrocities that occurred um, uh, in, in Europe um, uh, during the Holocaust, those systems uh, were often um, developed in by consultation with Canada, who was doing it at the time uh, with Indigenous people, and it was viewed by those people as being so successful that these those were then adopted within um, many different um, nations that were either trying to assimilate or annihilate um, their people. Um, so with the reserve system, um, those policies of assimilation um, via the past system, for example, so, you know, up until, you know, the, the 70s, really, that um, the RCMP or the Indian agents um, would grant or um, not grant um, folks um, past systems to or the past um, to be able to leave their reserve. And again, when we think of from a healthcare perspective, um, the inability to leave um, the reserve, even, uh, I mean, obviously for a whole bunch of socio, you know, um, economic reasons, but um, again, just grounding this in, in a healthcare lens, um, what the impact on, on people are. 
And this was a way, again, to control um, people, well, every aspect of, of people's lives, every, every aspect. Um, regist being a registered or status Indian, um, again, and within the, the Indian Act, how people were um, able to um, use that to control people. So when we look at enfra enfranchisement, for example, uh, a real big push to have people um, lose their, their status, which gave them um, that, that, um, that sovereignty in terms of their their um, relationship to Canada and and their you know treaty rights and um, all the things that were promised within those beginning negotiations within Canada as it was developing. And so enfranchisement looked like, um, you know, Indigenous people, um, you know, not gaining the right to vote in Canada up until the late 60s. And if one did choose to um, vote prior or, uh, you know, in my grandmother's case, you know, marry a non-Indigenous um, uh, man or... Um, enlist in the army, one lost um, their status um, and their, their rights as an Indigenous person with that status. Um, so a real, um, again, disrupture um, and erasure with the intention of, of annihilating all Indigeneity within Canada. The implementation of band councils, so disrupting Indigenous governance systems um, that, again, for since time immemorial, have um, long been um, tried, tested, and true, and and had um, you know lots of well, and actually informed a lot of um, the American and Canadian Constitution uh, in in the terms of democracy itself. Um, but that disruption and the implementation of band councils. Um, really, um, you know, again, severed those, those um, teachings and ways of being within Indigenous governance systems. Um, and then Indian residential schools, which we'll, we'll go over a little bit um, more later. Um, and I think uh, most folks have a, have a pretty um, uh, basic understanding of what, um, what Indian residential schools are, but also what, what implications that had on disruption of family and, um, and yeah, and the family system. And then Indian hospitals that work really closely with, with IRSs. And, um, you know, it's really, um, really starting to come to light um, and a lot of the survivors are speaking out about the impacts of Indian hospitals that again ran well into the 70s and um, even early 80s in some cases and were again you know segregated um, e even if it didn't exist let's say as its own institution like um, the Nanaimo Hospital here in in, in BC um, you know I lived two blocks up from the Vancouver General Hospital and when I was doing some research you know found out that the basement at one time was used um, to segregate um, uh, Indigenous people um, accessing care um, because of the fear of the Indian TB that was really um, a motivator and a tactic used as propaganda to be able to, you know, have um, segregated hospitals for Indigenous people um, across across this country. <laughs> so, um, again, just really, um, it's, we have to really ground ourselves in, in the understanding that um, our whole healthcare system as we know it, and a lot of the institutions um, within government and all of society within Canada, um, when we look at it in relationship to Indigenous peoples of these lands, um, was really um, the intention was um, to, for, for government um, at the time and, you know, and that basis and how that stems into all social structures, even today, was that Indigenous people do not exist. Um, and so, you know, this quote from John A. MacDonald, I think, is really, um, really hard to read and, and um, also hard to, you know, digest um, when we think about, you know, what Canada 
for many for ourselves and also you know internationally stands for and yet this is also you know one of the truths and premises that our entire system exists upon and so um again you know if we don't lean into what some of these very you know ugly truths are then we don't have a way of disrupting it And so when we think about um, these, um, this foundation, um, for lack of a better word, within, within Canada, when it comes to relationships with Indigenous peoples, one of the things that I think, um, you know, we're, we're not taught in school, I certainly wasn't taught this in school, um, and um, we build these, um, so, so it wasn't taught about, you know, in depthly in any way shape or form um, some of the harms that I just reviewed but also not only were those harms um, not reviewed but also um, what I would call you know myths or, or fantasies or what a lot of um, great scholars have called you know Canadian myths um, that um, also make it so hard to believe sometimes that these um, these things existed and continue to exist in different ways and one of those myths I think um, is Canadian's healthcare system. And I think, you know, in a lot of our, um, the way, you know, we, we, we were, we grew up, how we've come to understand um, Canadian's healthcare system, and for ourselves, even as, as nurses within that system, that, um, you know, it often gets touted as one of the best healthcare systems in the world. And, you know, I, I hear all the time people looking down, you know, on, on, um, other um, countries <laughs> um, that maybe this to the south of us and um, you know thinking of ourselves as as a model of care that um, really um, when we look at in terms for Indigenous folks as accessing care and that segregation it is it could not be further from from that um, idea that folks have and um, and it not only that is also um, a place of where extreme harm and assimilation and violence has occurred. I'm also mindful. Um, I, I promised um, Barbara and Donna that I would pause at some point and just check in on the chat and for questions. And I meant to say, sorry, at the beginning that, you know, we really want, um, we recognize there's, uh, um, oh my gosh, a lot of participants. Um, so it can be challenging um, to have, you know, kind of a more intimate um, conversation, but we really want to support people, um, you know, asking questions and, um, and, and supporting dialogue. So if anybody has questions, please jump in on the, the chat and we're gonna try to moderate it and, and get to them as much as possible. So I will just take pause here. Um, Barbara, is there, is there, I can't see the chat, but is there any questions that are popping up that it would be good to pause? Hi Dawn, thanks so much. Um, so right now there aren't any questions that have been popping up in the chat, but maybe now that we have a little bit of a pause, um, people can um, put questions into their chat and we can also invite people along the way uh, to, if you don't have a question right now, but a question comes up as Dawn is talking, please feel free to um, put it into the chat. Uh, Morag and I will be monitoring it and uh, we'll then when we have the next pause, we will bring those questions up to Dawn. So right now I don't see anything that is coming into the chat. So perhaps we can move on, Dawn, until we get um, questions that are in the chat. But thank you for checking. Great, thanks. And as one of my coworkers always says at the, at the beginning when, when he's he's asking folks to volunteer to, to jump in, to, to take a healthy risk. And you know, if it, even if something is coming up for you that, that you want to share or that was new to you or that you want to know more about, um, this is just such a great opportunity also to help, you know, us gauge also um, what is important to cover and what folks may not know or what they do know. So um, just really want to encourage everybody to hopefully feel um, in these really hard conversations, a safe um, space to be able to lean into some of that vulnerability and to, to put that out there. Because I'm sure um, I can guarantee if you're thinking it or you have that question, so do others. Okay. So um, one of the, um, so again, just back to um, 
the the ideas that we have about um, Canadians' healthcare system. Um, so in 2014, the UN um, did an inquest into the health of Indigenous peoples in Canada. Um, this has all uh, happened in different um, ways, you know, across. Um, um, the past centuries, um, but but really highlighting more recent ones and from an international lens, um, uh, because of the complaints of human rights uh, within within Canada, um, UN did uh, an inquest and um, found that Canada was in serious violation of human rights, but particularly those discrepancies uh, when it relates to healthcare access between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in Canada. And then since um, that inquest um, in in 2018, and actually a follow up one is due in 2023 as well um, from the UN, but um, Canada has also, um, uh, because of this, have done their own inquest um, as well. And, you know, uh, Canada rate ranks under um, some of like as one of the lowest countries um, in terms of when it looks at at health for Indigenous people um, internationally. So um, again, um, you know, it can't be understated uh, how tremendous the harms have been. Um, and in, in this way, also um, helping us understand how these harms are also um, continue and what that legacy and the impact of that harm and what that continues to look like today. Uh, again, when we look at the Indian Act and we look at access to care, and we're going to cover it a bit more coming up, but um, how that disruption and that ongoing impact um, just is, is um, directly related to those um and i mean i think most of us know you know um at some level some of the the statistics when it comes to um the the discrepancies between indigenous people's health and non-indigenous people um in canada are are the gap is just continues to be so wide um so we have to look at where that's coming from and what that real what this real source of that is Oh, and so in, in 2016 and 2018, Chief, Chief Health Officer um, showed again um, from a Canadian, um, you know, uh, report um, that Indigenous um, people were lower in life expectancy, income, education, with their access to housing, food security, and particularly mental health. Um, uh, you know, suicide rates being, you know, six times in some locations, what it is for um, non-Indigenous um, for and uh, the difference between non-Indigenous and Indigenous people, um, it's, it's, it's shocking. So again, just grounding us back in so what that root cause is um, and the colonization and imposition of Eurocentric values related to health really have disrupted all facets of Indigenous health systems and practices. Um, and this has been, you know, the research is abundant on this. It is, it is undisputable. Um, and also, you know, I want to take uh, a moment. It's really hard, you know, to not even be um, colonized in some of the ways that I'm presenting, but I'm using, you know, all Western, um, you know, facts and, and science to, to point this out. But, um, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of um, Indigenous health advocates, obviously, that, that, um, and we'll talk about, you know, how, what some of that advocacy has looked like, and how that has been turned into reports and those grassroots movements um, that have been calling this out for, well, since contact, right? And um, only within the last, um, you know, few decades has um, Canadian consciousness really started to take a, a deeper look as to what, why these harms exist and, and what we can do about it. Um, and so when we're really getting to the crux and the heart of it, um, really all things point to anti-Indigenous racism um, as a, as a, a broader um, all in cap, cap um, encapsulating um, reason as to what continues to drive um, these inequities in health. Um, 
and I think, you know, um, even for myself, uh, you know, who thinks about this kind of stuff all the time, you know, sometimes I, I think about how, um, you know, when we talk about lots of the harm, sometimes we locate them so far in the past. And yet, you know, so many of those policies that I talked about at the beginning um, existed within most of our lifetimes um, that would be on the call today. Um, but also, and, and some of them also continue to exist. And so knowing that those are implemented and, and have existed, up until very, very recent history within, within our healthcare system. Um, of course, of course, you know, th this is what the impacts of health um, on health um, look like. And um, I just, I think it's really important to just constantly for myself, really, I'm just being reflexive for myself to remind myself um, just how recent all of these, these pieces are. And I think, you know, even of my grandmother and, and what she faced in her lifetime, and that's just like two generations, right? Like away from me from sitting in this moment and what has happened within her lifetime you know almost every single thing on that list um had occurred and um when we think about what that then means for um, folks accessing care today, we can, you know, stop and imagine and and think about um, where that distrust and harm, and also, you know, even um, to to the point of anti-indigenous racism, how that racism is still translated, you know, even unconsciously within so many areas of our system. Um, and I think, you know, when I think of human rights movements, you know, I think, um, you know, just even within the states, for example, in the 60s, it's like, you know, just when people get the right to vote or, or when segregation ends, yes, you know, formally within a system, those, those things are stopped. So, you know, again, within a Canadian context, you know, uh, Indian residential schools or Indian hospitals, yes, they are done, but it's not like everybody wakes up that next morning and all of that, um, all of the um, racism that exists that contributed to those doesn't all of a sudden just disappear. And we know, um, you know, from a cultural standpoint, um, that those those ideologies can be so deeply embedded, and it takes generations to work that out. And I really think when we pull back, we are very much in that generation right now of recognizing how those pieces um, have contributed today, but also are ongoing, and what our generation needs to do to disrupt that. And so some of the examples of how that ongoing harm looks today and what that looks like um, within present day systems within healthcare, you know, we have a few examples here that I, I want to highlight and go over. Um, so in the top left corner. Um, we have Brian Sinclair seen here. And, um, and I've picked these, these pieces to um, these, sorry, these examples um, of, of folks or instances that, I, that really um, from different provinces, but also um, that are national issues as well. So Brian Sinclair was um, an Indigenous man in Manitoba um, who uh, over 10 years ago, now just over 10, um, was um, went to an emergency room in Manitoba to um, because he was having um, symptoms of an infection and what we now know was a ur urinary tract infection. And because of his symptoms and the, the severity of his 36 hour stay while um, in, in, in the emergency room, um, we're, you know, um, you know, delirium, vomiting, and um, the assumption was from the healthcare and triage team at the time was that um, he was intoxicated. And again, going on stereotypes about um, Indigenous people and, and alcohol and being intoxicated. So he wasn't seen and he ended up dying from a very treatable um, UTI. And um, again, we'll go over it in, in, a, in a little bit when we're looking at some of the reports, but the, 
um, you know, the, the denial of racism. And it's interesting when, when looking at, at Brian Sinclair's um, case versus some of the more recent examples. Um, and again, just a decade ago, and when we look at, um, again, just a way of, of looking at how we talk about these issues within, you know, a broader society within Canada, there was such, um, you know, vitriol and, and denial that racism um, was a cause within his death. And only, you know, again, the really uh, important grassroots movement, um, grassroots movement and advocates at the time that um, continue to, to work to advocate for him um, and to eliminate um, the racism and uh, that he experienced that his family wants to see um, as a disruptor for his legacy. Um, <clears throat> that it's only, I mean, they just come out with the, the 10 year report again. Um, and, and only now is it really kind of being taken up in a more fulsome way. Um, and then in contrast, um, well, actually not history repeats itself in many ways, but um, for Joyce Eshaquan, so um, we, the, the picture um, in the bottom middle, um, that's purple with the candle. Um, so Joyce Eshaquan was, um, uh, in Joliet in Quebec, um, uh, accessing care, um, was having an allergic reaction to one of the meds. And she had said that, that she had um, an allergy to this medication. And when she was um, really, you know, um, suffering and feeling the effects because it was given to her anyway, um, uh, she was not only dismissed, but um, it was uh, an opportunity for the nurses to really double down on, again, the anti-Indigenous racism um, that they um, felt. And, um, you know, Joyce had oof, the foresight to, to film it. So um, it really was undeniable, um, again, the, the level of violence and racism that um, she faced. But I, I think, you know, when we look at, um, those cases, um, and, and there's many, many, many examples of Indigenous um, families and family members who have either faced serious harm and or lost their lives um, being denied access to care um, or um, in, in trying to access care. And um, had she not filmed it, um, I think it would have been another case where it would have gone um, unnoticed or unheard. And I think of all of um, those survivors or those or the families of, of folks who didn't survive, um, that didn't have that opportunity um, and were denied or dismissed within the healthcare system that harm occurred. Um, so I think that this particular um, moment um, and what Joyce was able to, or sorry, Ms. Eshaquan was able to offer, um, especially all of us as healthcare providers was very concrete evidence of what that looks like in real time. And then above, um, Joyce Eshaquan, we have um, Jordan River Anderson, who um, was basically um, the, at the heart of the movement um, for Jordan's principle and um, the tireless work of Cindy Blackstock and team um, to improve access um, for care for Indigenous children. And so um, Jordan River um, was a, a young boy who had a lot of complex care needs and uh, was accessing um, care out, out of his, you know, smaller remote community. Um, and the federal government at the time and the provincial government um, were fighting over who was going to pay for his services based again on um, legislation within the Indian Act. Um, because um, indigenous or status Indians access their care um, or their funds federally. Um, and so it was a fight between um, the province um, and, and federal agency agents of, of who was going to put the bill. So um, unfortunately, um, Jordan died in hospital, never having gone home, um, where that would have never happened to a non-Indigenous child accessing care. Um, and, you know, again, just in the news this week, and this is again, yeah, 2005 um, was, was when he passed. And just again this week, um, you know, Cindy Blackstock was in the news um, 
after I don't know how many appeals um, and, and with with um, the federal government to improve care and and um, also not only um, in terms of like um, services and funding, but also um, the child welfare system in general. Um, so really important, again, when we consider also community health nursing, that this is, um, um, I really encourage everybody to go to their website and, and to look at um, <clears throat> how to apply Jordan's principle in your own practice, um, but also the, that legacy and the work that, that's taking place. And then in the bottom right, um, I think, you know, very topical right now um, and a lot of, you know, class action lawsuits and, and um, grassroots advocacy in regards to forced sterilization um, in an ongoing way. And there's reports, um, you know, as, as recent as just a couple of years ago of, um, of forced or coerced sterilization for Indigenous women. And this was a really, again, when we look at legacies, a long uh, legacy of harm and, and violence within Canada and within the healthcare system of, of um, you know, having legislation that allowed eugenics, that supported eugenics, and that specifically targeted Indigenous women as well. Um, and so what that means um, today and what that means in healing those harms and, and also disrupting it in an ongoing way. And then in the top right, we have um, missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. And um, final report has been has been released um, um, a couple of years ago. And um, still, uh, you know, um, the Native Women's Society has, um, you know, ongoing report cards, and there's still a tremendous amount of work needed um, and calls to action that have remained un unaddressed. And when we look at one of the key um, social um, issues within within our within our society right now, um, this is where one um, one that you know deserves so much more attention and action and care. And again, you know, wouldn't even be at the forefront had it not been um, for the work of tremendous advocates and, and grassroots movements and families of survivors um, calling for action. And so when, again, um, just, examining how racism in particular is manifested. I think, um, you know, um, Joyce Eshaquan is, is a really good example of um, what that looks like and also what that really intense um, denial um, is. And I think, um, I, uh, the, this top quote um, is, is um, was actually um, from an advocate um, following the death of George Floyd in the States um, uh, and, and Black activists saying, you know, um, you know, these, the, these acts of racism, it's not that they're getting worse, it's just that, you know, we're now in, in a society where they're getting filmed. And I think, um, again, you know, looking, we'll talk uh, more as well, just about that really um, ingrained, even with all the proof um, of, of what Joyce filmed, um, the, the really strong denial of, 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 of that racism was the root cause, which I just, it's just mind blowing to me how those connections can't be made. Um, and yet, um, it it is um, has always been, I think, one of the main discourses that ke keeps racism going in an, in a really strong way within society. And then on the opposite side of the country, another um, really poignant example it, um, for, for those outside of BC that might not know um, about it um, is the In Plain Sight Report. And this was based on um, a game that was flagged as being played in different um, emergency departments across the province of BC, where healthcare providers were guessing the blood alcohol level of Indigenous patients accessing care. And so um, there was an investigation into it. Um, the Ministry of Health um, took the allegations very seriously at the time, um, not only um, hired a team to look at it, but also used it as an opportunity to um, broaden the scope to see um, what um, 
what were the experiences of Indigenous patients within British Columbia at trying to access care and what and how um, Indigenous anti-Indigenous racism specifically um, was showing up and the amount of, um, I, I think everybody, not, not that anybody was surprised by the results, but the overwhelming uh, engagement from not only Indigenous people um, within the province um, that were sharing their experiences, um, either for themselves or for family members, but also of healthcare workers that were, were reporting um, really harmful um, examples um, be, and, and they had kind of like a um, just different ways that people could share their experiences and they did it in a way that um, you know was anonymous because they really wanted to um, capture and get a sense um, of, of what was going on um, for better or for worse whether that was the, the right or wrong way to do it but but it did offer people um, I think an opportunity to share in a very um, unfiltered way and um, you know there's volumes um, and and examples upon examples um, and this really was um, a um, important um, political shift within the province as well. And I think um, is a really interesting example too of what happens when, um, you know, um, the province itself um, does that important work and investigation and what those changes look like within BC, like the landscape is completely different. Um, and um, even though there's, you know, again, an abundance of literature reports, um, UN inquests, like we, it's not like any of this data is new, but it's interesting to me. And I think for folks in, in BC, it would be interesting to, to hear what folks from from BC that are on on that are here today um just the shift in in how it's um within consciousness within within um you know Canadian or within BCers um but also the impacts within the healthcare system it's like the conversations have just been very very different and I think it it provides um opportunity to address issues that have you know for a long time for those of us in this work have been shut down um so, and again, interesting when we, when everyone just locates where they're at in different provinces. And for myself, like I said, I grew up um, in Mohawk territory in Montreal and the difference in discourse is just, um, yeah, very different. And so again, when we look at like what that denial of racism is and how um, that's taken up in, in conversation and when we look at the news and how people do or do not talk about it, you know, um, so, so here's an example of, you know, um, within BC, um, there was even just like this report of this game happening and it was like full stop, you know, and government at the time did that full investigation. Um, whereas, you know, the difference between you know, for Joyce Sashaquan in, in Quebec, even with, you know, very hard evidence of this, um, the filming that she had done, and um, the premier at the time, Monsieur Legault, um, is, you know, just doubling down at the time saying that there is no systemic racism in Quebec, that these are a few bad apples. And, and it's so interesting when I think about like these few bad apples and it's like any, any of us know within nursing, there's no way um, that those nurses, you know, existed in a vacuum and didn't also have bystanders that were also complicit within that um, incident and what the harm was and why didn't anybody stop it? Why didn't anybody step in? How did that happen, right? Um, and and then to say, um, and to really, um, um, I mean, not only resist reports, but try to, you know, disrupt those reports from happening. And the, you know, coroner's report for, for Joyce Ashaquan, you know, undeniably um, no, you know, um, um, reported that anti-Indigenous racism was at the at the root cause of her death. And even with that, um, you know, the denial um, was so strong. And then, you know, for, um, 
the children and the, the bodies that were found um, in uh, to Kamloops, Sequetmik territory, commonly known as Kamloops in, in um, BC, the, the first 215 children that were found. Um, while, you know, I think, um, again, you know, when we just look at overall how, how these conversations have come up within Canada, you know, the TRC well documents that, um, you know, uh, the death and, and bodies were ch of children, um, by all accounts from, from survivors, um, was that this existed and, and folks knew that this existed and yet it really took, um, you know, again, hard evidence of, these surveyors um, um, finding um, the specific locations of the bodies for it really to impact Canadian consciousness and and for that, you know, really um, um, outpour of, of care and awareness for a lot of people. And yet even in that, um, the amount of um, genocide deniers and the questioning and um, um, was was not um, not not small. Like it, it wasn't like this was a you know a small amount of fringe folks. Like there was a lot of people that questioned and denied um, and continue to do so. Um, oh yeah, and I spoke about sorry the bottom one for a few bad apples. Um, and I, I really um, appreciate and value this quote from Ebran Kendi, who's in it, um, a Black scholar and activist in the States that says, you know, the very heartbeat of racism is denial. And I think it goes back to um, when I first started off um, just talking about what um, Elder Jerry Ullman says, where, you know, you cannot say goodbye to a problem before you first say hello to it. We can't address these issues and we can't um, eliminate racism if we're going to deny that it's even, uh, you know, a main part of what the, the health inequities that Indigenous people are facing, that that's the root cause. Um, so it really requires us to, you know, take pause and really um, understand and and um, put that, put, put like the, those glasses on um, to be able to see how racism shows up in all these different ways. And I think, again, you know, when we think about how, um, I think, Part of that denial or or that that urge to deny racism is because even when we think about racism, you know how have has it been conceptualized up until now? I think a lot of time. I mean, even for myself, growing up, right? Like I, you know, um, and again, you know, obviously my my context is is. Um, is I grew up, you know, in very, you know, uh, dominating white settler society in Montreal, and, um, you know, had that disruption to my own indigeneity, especially in my early years. And, you know, the way I was taught and thought of racism, it was like, you know, folks in white sheets burning crosses on lawns, right? Like, it was just seemed so um, extreme and not related to Canada in my mind. And, um, I think uh, we have to challenge and reflect for ourselves what that means and looks like for us, but also, again, not only for ourselves as individuals, but as nurses, how is racism showing up within healthcare system? And what's that legacy for those, those broader structures and how even healthcare is conceptualized and exists within Canadian society? Um, and how that race, racial foundation informs so much of how we operate within the system. I'm gonna take a moment and pause here and just see if there's any questions that have come up or comments. Hi there, um, Don. Um, thank you so much for, um, you know, this is a very, it's a very needed conversation. It's a hard conversation, but it's a needed conversation. And, you know, I really resonate when you say, you know, we're talking as nurses together and we say, how can this have happened? Um, one of the questions that did come up is, uh, it's talking about um, that we hear about, unfortunately, sharing the discriminatory experiences of Indigenous people within the healthcare system, meaning in the, within the hospital setting. And uh, one of the questions was related to like community healthcare. Do you know anything about like home health, primary healthcare? Um, or anything else that has happened in the community health sector. I just think it's 
you know, we don't, it, it's, it's important for us to, to know and um, in that context as well. Uh, we just, I just wanted to share that question with you. Yeah, thank you. It, it's a really important question. And, you know, I, I am speaking right now, you know, very broadly within nursing. But I think if we go back, um, well, when we look at nursing and its history, and when we look at the, the origins of how nursing um, existed within Canada, um, you know, obviously community health nursing before, you know, biomedicine really took off, right? And, and when before, um, um, it, you know, everything was centric to hospitals. Um, when we look at some of those assimilative policies, and then again, that legacy, right? Uh, I think community health nursing um, was, again, it's so interesting when we look at nursing, both at the forefront of disrupting the harm, but also complicit in the harm. And when we think about, you know, child apprehension, forced sterilization, um, um, reserve system, um, remote, rural dislocation, um, um, so much of that um, existed within, within um, community health nursing, right? Um, and I think, you know, what, again, and we look at, like, some of, like, the offshoots of nursing um, that now exist as their own profession, but, um, you know, social work and, and all of those ones that now kind of are pegged as, um, you know, the source of, of um, let's say, the harm when we look at child apprehension, for example, just as one example, really, you know, at, at, at a time and era, that was um, community health nurses that were, um, you know, again, this is what's so complex is, you know, under that, when we look at those Canadian myths, you know, going out doing good um, and saving, you know, these, I'm using quotations for people that can't see me, um, but like saving these poor, you know, um, Indian children at the time, this is how it was viewed, right? I, I was, I actually, interestingly, um, was, um, someone had had um, watched um, one of the talks that I gave on YouTube and was a community health nurse and um, retired and an older generation. And um, she had contacted me um, and um, was just so upset and so outraged that um, in her mind that community health was was portrayed in this way um, it, well, and actually, and, I, and that's not even, I wasn't portraying anything related to community health, but I was talking about child apprehension and, um, and that whole system and, um, and also how it worked in close relationship with um, Indian residential schools and who ran Indian residential schools, right? And, and who took the children from the reserve to bring them to um, Indian residential schools. And, um, and I mean, and, and like, it's so hard, I'm sharing this example, but I want to be really clear, like, um, you know, I, um, I mean, I do have, have a certain level of judgments, but I also have, you know, empathy for how her whole worldview would have been disrupted. But, you know, she was uh, just very adamant that, um, and was so, so angry and hurt that, um, that, what what her work was, which was apprehending these children in as a community health nurse, um, was was being shed in in a negative light in her mind um, because she truly believed, you know, that she was doing good. And um, you know, I, tr I mean, obviously, you know, she was she was older, and and I was trying to, you know, hold as much grace and and care in the conversation um, when she contacted me, but also challenging some very problematic, um, and you know, violent acts um, that occurred, and you know, um, again, in her mind, she was like, you you just don't know, you don't know how hard done by those children were, you don't know, and they, but again for her and her generation not knowing or or not being 
taught or, and I mean, who knows what she did or didn't know, but um, all of those assimilative policies. So even, so let's say, you know, she was witnessing, you know, harm or a disruption of, of family um, relationships, but like, what was the root cause of that? And apprehension of children wasn't the, the solution to remedying if, if that legacy of harm existed. I'm just sharing that example to just, you know, really highlight how, um, why am I highlighting that example? <laughs> to, to show, um, I think the legacy of nursing, but also how hard it is, I think, for nursing to locate themselves as part of that assimilation policy. And like, I, and it's hard for everyone, right? I mean, nobody goes into this profession, and I think of her an ex as an example, being like, you know, how do I cause harm? Like, no one that's not why any of us do what we do. And that's, I think, what her example really highlights too, is that um, what, what I, I would call, I love this word, <laughs> um, ontological disruption. It's like her whole worldview was, was shattered, right? It's like her entire identity of, uh, and her, you know, the, her proud legacy as a nurse for, you know, decades, I would imagine, um, of what she thought was doing good work, you know, um, and I wasn't the one who said she didn't do good work, but, you know, she obviously came to that conclusion on her own and just how painful and hard that was for her. And I think all of us have a certain level of recognition to do and sorry I know that wasn't exactly specifically the question but I guess one of the things that I encourage everybody to do whether it's you know myself working at women's and children's or when I'm working in palliative care or you're working in community health nursing this shows up in all different kinds of way and it's um it is our professional responsibility in my opinion and the regulators that we examine how it is showing up and it's insidious and it, it can be well in, and you know I think again using her as an example you know, what, what is very obvious to us now was not obvious to her in her practice at that era and time. And so what, what is occurring right now that doesn't, that we might be blind or biased to that we don't see. And I think we all have to pause and think about what that looks like and do that, you know, personal and professional research um, and building of awareness and educating ourselves to find out how it is manifesting in an ongoing way. Thank you so much, Dawn, for sharing um, that answer. It's a, there's a lot there. Thank you. Uh, there's nothing else in the chat right now. And so I'll keep monitoring and um, and let you know if there's anything else. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, so one of the reasons why um, I personally also got into, you know, healthcare policy was one, because I, you know, witnessed and experienced um so much um, anti-Indigenous racism within the healthcare settings that I worked in. Um, I, you know, have so many examples. Um, and, you know, for myself to not, not, I mean, I'm, I, I'm white passing and not everybody um, knew that, that I um, had Indigenous ancestry in, in, my workplaces. So sometimes I was privy to very um, candid conversations that may not have happened had folks, you know, thought or knew that I was Indigenous. Um, but um, yeah, some very harmful, um, just even, yeah, personal experiences um, that were really, um, you know, yes, interpersonal, but also systemic. And I could see these ongoing issues just like repeating themselves. And um, I wanted to be involved in a way, um, um, especially as a nurse, and especially having that lens and context. This is also a plug for folks to enter into policy work um, <laughs> that, that are nurses. Um, that um, how do we, you know, disrupt um, these these systems um, that we work in um, at a larger level? And so um, I so within BC, we have a provincial um, health authority that offers specialized services across the province. Um, and they do have they have an indigenous health department um, that is much more robust than when I started again, uh, you know, directly related to the in plain sight report here. Um, but one of the things that I, I um, had trouble understanding was like, you know, why the healthcare system was 
had so much trouble adopting, um, you know, these broader mandates and these calls to action and the research that is just abundant and all of these, um, you know, very tangible um, ways to disrupt the system um, and why they weren't being implemented in fulsome ways. And, you know, I, I, I'm just pulled on a few very key ones, and I specifically pulled some from, you know, different provinces um, and, and federal um, um, ones here. Um, but so, like, why, what is that disconnect um, between um, what is a very clear, you know, pathway forward and, and what, how, why is the system so slow moving, particularly within health? Um, why is it so slow moving when it comes to adopting um, this abundance of, you know, reports um, that exist? And again, I think it goes back to, um, I think it goes back to our discomfort. I think it goes back to our, the denial of racism. And I also think it goes to um, the pervasiveness of, of those myths that I was talking about. And I think it's, I think that folks, um, I think we've all been educated within a Canadian healthcare system. And when I say educated, I mean like primary school, high school, but also nursing school um, to not fully understand the depth of these harms and what this looks like and what that urgency is um, and, and what is needed. Um, because again, the, the facts and the reports and the data and the research is all here. So yeah, just doing a bit of a highlight of, of what I would call broader indigenous health led policies and how that translates to the work that we do. So we have the TRC specifically number 24 is calling out or calling in <laughs> nursing um, to uh, address and um, require nursing schools to study and take a course dealing with Indigenous health issues, including the history and le legacy of residential schools. So the TRC, just as a reminder for everybody, is, is while it is very focused on um, residential schools, it also is examining in the full report, right? Um, all of the, the social um, health um, issues that are surrounded and a legacy um, of, of um, the IRS system um, as and to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, to have a better understanding of treaty and Aboriginal rights. And I think this line in particular, we have a lot of issues. I and mean, when we look at um, community health nursing and, and for myself in nursing school, like I was not taught um, what is the relationship and what how is care managed for status Indian versus non-status Indian um, within the healthcare system. And again, when we look at who can access even care from community health nursing or not, um, this is a really key area that nursing, I, I think, has a lot of work to do. Um, and again, when we look at like what we can each do individually is to better understand what those treaty and indigenous rights are um, for, for access to care. I think access is probably, um, you know, top top three for sure for for community health nursing in terms of issues about who can or cannot access that care when it comes to indigeneity. Um, and then Indigenous teaching and practices. And so what that care looks like, right? So, um, you know, we have professional practice standards very clearly, and that model is biomedicine. And when we look at re regulation, and we look at what kind of care and services can be provided, it is all within that Western worldview. And is in very um, clear violation of, of UNDRIP, right? United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People very clearly states that Indigenous people have the right to practice their traditional medicines and ways of being. And I think, again, when we think about it in like aspirational terms, we can all, you know, Canadians can get behind it. But when you get behind it, when, or when you start looking at what that looks like within regulation, um, there are laws that also prohibit some of like, I mean, Canadian laws that prohibit and disrupt um, that support to sovereignty when it comes to what Indigenous health practices, um, how that can be practiced within 
you know, a, a regulated profession, for example. We've got a lot of work to do. Um, so again, yeah, focusing on, on uh, cultural safety, human rights, and anti-racism. And you look at how some of the languages even changed and just how important the TRC was in, in, in shifting and moving the conversation along even for, for what we're talking about today and how there's been even an evolution since, since this language as well. Um, uh, reclaiming power in place. And so, you know, I think, uh, so this is the final report for missing and murdered Indigenous women, and again, flagging for community health nursing. You know, it's really interesting for this report how I don't see a lot of folks or a lot of spaces in healthcare really leaning into these calls to action. And yet, um, this report does such a fulsome overview as to why um, um, this you know, um, pandemic of like missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls exists within Canada, sorry, or endemic. Um, and I think a lot of times the focus is just like on the justice system or um, the RCMP, but there's all of these incredible gaps that exist that have resulted in Indigenous women and girls and um to us queer folks um, not being able to have safety within society, but also what does that mean and look like within healthcare systems and social healthcare systems and community health nursing. And, um, you know, the gaps have been well notified or well documented and, and um, targeted within the report. And it's so interesting, again, how nursing, I feel, doesn't um, really lean into this in a fulsome way. And, you know, I, I've done a lot of reviews of the different, different, you know, um, national and provincial, not only associations, but unions and, and regulation. And this is not a report that, that nursing, um, you know, leans into a lot and, and Im, Im, implicates themselves into in actioning this. And I, I think that's very misguided. And nursing has such a key role, um, and community health nursing has such a key role in, in addressing the gaps that exist that that make it that, you know, predators are preying on 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 these these folks. And um, what are the social and health gaps that have led to this crisis? Um, then we have UNDRIP. Um, so again, I spoke to to this and UNDRIP, I mean, again, is a bit beyond our conversation today, but um, addressing what, um, like how, how Canada has or hasn't um, taken up UNDRIP and to what degree. And so Canada was, you know, one of the last countries, um, again, on earth um, to lean in and formally adopt UNDRIP. Um, and that, again, was really very much because we're in such gross violation um, of, and, you know, anybody who, I mean, all of us know as nurses, you know, uh, the UN, when they come out with these declarations on rights, uh, you know, either the rights of children, they, all these different, like, great charters, um, the bar is low, right? Like, these are, these are supposed to be basic human rights that countries are, or, are, like, should should abide by and are created because they aren't necessarily. Um, and again, it's to bring it up to, you know, just some very foundational concepts around human rights. And so for, so, I mean, again, if we just like pause for a moment and recognize, you know, America, um, or sorry, the US, um, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia refusing to um, sign on till years later after everybody else did really shows just what that, um, you know, political implications are, but also, again, you know, how, how, what those inequities look like within our states are so glaring. Um, I wanted to say something else, but I lost it. Um, it'll come back to me. Um, oh, yes, sorry. And, and I think, <laughs> and I think, again, especially for associations and for nursing um, advocates, like how, you know, okay, Indigenous people have the right to their traditional medicines and maintain their health practices, including conservation of their vital medicine plants, um, have the right to access without any discrimination to all social and health services. 
nurses should be at the forefront of advocating for UNDRIP. Like this is like every province should have this. Only BC has it within their legislation and it's brand new. And, you know, they're just starting to formulate the action plan about what that would look like. Um, I, I, my, one of my questions is where is that push and pressure from nursing when we look at advocacy and, and basic rights? This should be, I think, one of our, our top priorities as a profession. And then the interim recommendations from the Brian Sinclair Working Group. And so um, recommendation number three in particular, that unions and nursing and medical professions organize organizations issue clear and unequivocal position statements of zero tolerance for racism in the workplace. And this is something that that still hasn't happened in a fulsome way. I think, again, following the In Plain Sight report, BC, um, you know, is just at a place of, of starting to do this work in a more um, deliberate way. Um, but, you know, for, for myself, you know, I can just use this example, like, um, I've been, um, I started writing the anti-racism report with with um, our Indigenous health team, you know, over two and a half years ago, and it's still not released within within our health authority. And there's a real um, resistance, but also um, challenge that the system faces. And what does zero tolerance for racism going to look like? And when, so let's just even pause like the healthcare system. What is that going to look like for nursing? What does that look like um, for um, for self-regulation and for our colleges? And how are we going to do this? How are we going to bridge the gaps between um, our um, lack of education and understanding and all the things that we've reviewed this morning and direct care practice. What is accountability going to look like? And I think we have to be involved in those conversations. Nurse have not only be involved in the conversation, we have to be leading what that looks like um, in, in very strategic ways. So, um, Harlan Pruden, um, he is the Indigenous Health Director um, for the BCCDC here um, in BC. And um, he has this lovely saying in, in one of the, uh, he was mentoring me in, in, in a whole bunch of different ways, but one of the things he said to me that, that really stuck with me that I carry forward just in my practice is does the remedy match the harm? And I think I love it partially because of my nursing background, because I just think it's such a good analogy and helpful for me to understand and relate it um, to um, practice around cultural safety and addressing anti-Indigenous racism. And he was saying, you know, when he was questioning the healthcare system and how we're going about the work and, and how we all come together, he's, he's not a nurse, but um, how we all come together to, to do this work. And you know, when we think about all the harms that, that I've reviewed up until this point, and we look at the action on behalf of the healthcare system and nursing, I'm just going to locate ourselves in that, um, does the remedy match the harm? Does the actions and the outcry and the efforts and the supports um, and the funding and the resources match the harm that has just been described? And, you know, he, he likens it to, to like, you know, if, if someone comes in and I love it because again, he, he's not a nurse, but it was such a great example, but he's like, you know, someone comes into the emergency department with a gaping wound, um, you're not offering them a band-aid, right? Like there is, there is extensive um, care and support that is specifically needed that I think we haven't figured out yet. And I think we need to ask ourselves why um, that hasn't happened, because I think in uncovering the why will help us get to, um, sorry, my little guy, even with all, all of the prep to say that mom's on this important meeting, it's still hard to not open that door. Um, so, um, sorry, I got a little disrupted there. Does all of, um, do, do we have all of the resources and, and supports needed to disrupt the start? So yeah, sorry, Th figuring out what the why is, because I think the why will inform where some of um, our challenges are. 
And, but then not dwelling in the why, and most importantly, like taking action and action and tangible accountability measures are needed at this juncture in ensuring that we are doing this work in an important way. And when I look at like cultural safety and anti-racism uh, within healthcare, it's interesting to me to look at like different ways that um, organizations or, you know, nursing associations or nursing in general has gone about this work where we're very, you know, in many aspects, evidence-based practice. And yet um, we seem to have trouble grounding ourselves in what are the very clear strategies. And again, if I go back those couple of slides with all of those mandates, calls to actions, reports, um, we seem to still struggle in like, how do we address anti-Indigenous racism? And I don't say that in a way like, like it is hard. This is, these are deeply embedded social structures that are, are, are so harmful and very insidious in so many ways. And so how do we, um, how do we do that? That's the, it, of course, it's not just like, there's not one simple, easy answer, but there are a lot of available uh, roadmaps to help and research to help guide us in that process. And I think, um, again, it's our professional ethical responsibility to figure out more deeply and more strategically and deliberately how we're going to go about this work. I'm going to pause here again for some questions. And also it is 1035. I'm mindful of the time too. And I do want to offer time. Um, and we do have a second session and I've got it, you know, strategically that I've got availability on both ends to be able to, to navigate it. So I just want to open it up for, for questions um, in a more fulsome way based on everything that we've discussed thus far. Um, and then we can see where we can go from there because it, I think, um, yeah, so important that we engage in 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 the discussion piece to um, also brainstorm and think about how we can action this work. And so, even if folks don't have um, specific questions per se, I you know even in the chat or or to come on and 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 talk about you know ways that you see this you know has has this discussion helped inform how you might see this within your own practice and what could that action look like within a community healthcare context. Thanks, Dawn. It's Moray here. Um, very, very interesting uh, presentation and hard to listen to, but gives us a lot of food for thought. And I do believe that nurses really are at the forefront of making a change. So we will start with some of the questions. So I will start and Barb and I will probably tag team a little bit. So the question that we have now are what are the key ways that community health nurses can help make the healthcare system more accessible and culturally safe at the individual and community levels, such as meeting Indigenous people at health units, schools, immunization clinics, home care visits? What can we do more of or less of? Right. That's a great question. And, and again, you know, I do think we have these roadmaps um, that exist, but all of us also have to do the work of um, figuring out what that looks like specifically for our area of practice. And, and one of the things that I have found is a lot of the reports, I mean, research is different because, uh, you know, you can find research specific to your area of practice, but um, a lot of the reports fo focus very much on like these broad, um, you know, either policies, recommendations, practices. And sometimes when they're broad like that, it's harder, I think, for us to translate what that looks like in my day to day. And so one of the things that I think the, the is a core principle and teaching of the TRC is to is is the truth right reconciliation always was meant to follow the truth and when we when they talk about the truth it's looking at okay how and where do does um do these harms come up in our practice and where are the limitations um and again like let's just take access to care where do they currently exist and again you know when we look at our educational system within nursing, um, within community health care, um, specifically as, as an area of practice, um, 
we we can't we can't address what we don't know and i think we're still very much in in a space and stage of now moving from those broader um areas of of awareness um so again that that list when i just first started off with like how okay what is the legacy of all of these different harms within a particular area of care um but what what does that look like within what's that legacy of harm within the care? And I think every area of nursing can and should do that work primarily. So the uncovering of the truth, what does that mean for my practice? So for example, so my department is new at BC Women's and Children's. I don't have a maternity background. I don't have a peds background, um, but I do have an ICS background. So Indigenous Cultural Safety. So one of the things that I'm doing and helping the organization do is to figure out, make those linkages of what that truth is. So for example, British Columbia, let's just look at women and children. So I, I was like, let but like let's do some research let's let's what what is our truth how are we how have we been complicit within a system and how are we doing it in an ongoing way because again we can't say goodbye to a problem until we first say hello so let's um figure out what that is because i think how a lot of people conceptualize it within my organization and the nurses and teams that i work with is that you know these are broader bigger political concepts but like birth um, um, alerts just ended in, in BC, so 2019. Um, eugenics legislation existed within BC um, for many decades. What's what's the ongoing legacy and impact of that? It's kind of, it's the, the devil's in the detail, right, of, of what that means. And then we can start developing our, our strategy to address these specifics of, of those areas of harm. And and again, I keep saying this, sorry, I'm repeating it, but like that, how those legacies either continue to be manifested in care within our services or not. And um, how do we need to, does the remedy match the harm for, for the legacy of the harm, but what currently exists that still needs to be disrupted? And I promise you, there is so much that continues to exist that needs to be disrupted. So even, again, when we look at access for our community health nursing, who can access your services and who can't? I, I mean, when we look at the way... Um, the reserve system, the Indian Act, and, and again, I'm not, obviously it's not community health nursing that's going to solve all of these bigger, broader political problems, but we have to examine in our specific areas what those harms are to then be a part of addressing them, either from a broader advocacy level, if that's the currently where we're at societally, or in direct care. Thanks, Don. That's uh, that's really good answer, and I know we have a lot to think about and a lot to take back. We do have another question, and the question is: What does zero tolerance for racism look like in welcoming in Indigenous nurses into our profession? We need to ensure that it is reported at minimum and welcome the importance of reporting these racist safety concerns. I know the college I work for needs to put something in place that is practiced. Mm. Yeah, that is such a great question and is very topical right now. And I think, um, yes, what does zero tolerance mean? I spend a lot of time in discussions within our health authority trying to figure out what that means. And it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, and they're challenging conversations, but you're right. Every regula regulator needs to... Um, be thinking about this and 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 figuring out what that looks like, but then so does every organization. Um, and 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 I mean again for community health and everything, either the health authority or department, um, what that's going to look like, and it poses a lot of challenges right now. I, I don't need to. Um, I'm sure. Um, this is not news to anybody, but, you know, we're, so the death of George Floyd um, in the States um, has, the, and the, the movement, the anti-racism movement following that um, has been the hu biggest human rights movement in the past century because of social media. So we are, again, when we just like, you know, span out again, we are in this moment right now, societally, 
that it's grasping. And there's there's no coincidence also that after or within actually that human rights movement that um, uh, all that advocacy around Joyce Ashaquan and her death, um, all of the the um, the support and will that went into the In Plain Sight report probably would not have existed or would have been different um, if we weren't in this also political climate. And as folks also know, though, there is this like, um, you know, again, a very zero tolerance uh, conversation around um, racism and discrimination um, and, you know, what some also would categorize as like cancel culture. and. It is really hard because we have to, like, the, these processes are not linear. Like, no one, you don't just wake up and then you are anti-racist. And in fact, I don't, I, I will go, personally, how I view it, I will go to my deathbed um, as constantly being in a process of unlearning and, um, and addressing racism unconscious bias discrimination that shows up within myself and my practice till the day I die um I think the, how we have been um socialized and how we've grown up within Canada um it is so um ingrained in so many of the systems um that we exist in that it is going to take i mean certainly certainly our lifetime um to and and more to start to you know to to really see some some important movement and and i say that as a call to action but also you know as a like it's such exciting times and agency where we can like very clearly talk about racism. You know, five years ago, if I was doing a, a, a talk, um, I was often encouraged, you know, like racism might like, you know, be too um, polarizing and you might lose people and, and like, you know, maybe, maybe talk about it, but don't actually say racism because it conjures up too much for folks. Right. And how exciting and wonderful that we can lean into these, uh, you know, discomfort, uncomfortable conversations in in more real ways but in that there that is a messy process that how we um unpack our own you know um again unconscious bias how racism comes up in our in our own minds in our practice how we're complicit i think of that you know community health nurse that reached out that was that was so upset that's that reflexive practice that that it's incumbent upon all of us to do um this you know really hard messy work and we're not always going to get it right that like um, two truths are exi uh, uh, exist in this world, we're, we're not going to make it out alive in this lifetime. And that <laughs> unpacking racism is incredibly uncomfortable and challenging. And in it, it, you're not doing it right, I think, if you're not feeling discomfort, and if you're not making mistakes. Um, um, I won't say the example because I don't want to put Donna on the spot, but, you know, Donna so beautifully shared just as we were starting this um, um, conversation, um, you know, how a, a, a dear colleague had called her out on something and just how open and welcoming she was in, that, that it helped her broaden her thinking. And I think it's those very small but really important actions that happen every day that help us do that work. Um, and, you know, yes, we need, we do, like, to the question, we need a zero tolerance. Um, we need, we need better, more clear accountability measures within, um, within our healthcare system and, and within nursing and within regulation. But we also have to be mindful that this is also a learning growing process and, and, it, and is messy. And how do we ensure that we call in um, and, um, and, you know, um, encourage um, this accountability type um, culture without also shutting it down? And zero tolerance I mean, I don't know how it sounds to everybody else on the on on here, but you know, I think it, it can be alienating too. And I mean, as you can tell from <laughs> this really long rant, you know, we, we all have to figure out what this is going to look like in practice, right? And we have to have these hard conversations, and we have to do it in a way like if we're going to say zero tolerance in within healthcare. Personally, I don't know what that looks like because I. 
from my van like viewpoint, I see help, I see racism in lots of different areas. So what are we canceling healthcare in Canada? Like, I don't think so. Um, we're not firing everybody. We, we like if 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 it's zero tolerance, um, and and I say that because that's I think that can be what that means to some people, but I think we have to um more broadly conceptualize. Um, and, and what I would, I, I think what I would prefer is what accountability looks like. If someone is, is displaying, um, um, uh, individual, you know, um, interpersonal racism, for example, or discrimination, um, you know, that's going to look different in different circumstances, right? Like there's so many varying degrees and we have to be adapt, uh, like adaptive or sorry, adaptable to what that can look like. And, we also have to be mindful, and this is where I'm also saying nursing has to pay really close attention. It's not just individual nurse, nurses, it's the healthcare system as a whole. There are structural, um, uh, you know, um, components that that I would say are much more harmful when it comes in, in terms of racism that uphold these practices and principles that need to be addressed. That's a lot more challenging to address. And when we say zero tolerance, I think, I think a lot of folks are thinking individuals, but like that has to apply to the systems we work in as well. It has to apply to nursing as well. And what does that look like? I'm I'm partially putting it out there. Like it's so it's such an important, rich conversation. And I hope this this dialogue, like um, you know, folks feel inspired to have this within their own departments and their own communities of nursing so that we can start to unpack and really create some action around this. Because I this is what I do know. If anybody knows, it's going to be nursing. So it's it's so important that us as nurses feel that agency and support. And, you know, I, I don't think we're going to have time today because we have 10 minutes left and this will be the conversation for, for next time. But cultural safety is a nursing concept. Like nurses invented it, right? nurses are the ones that brought it from indigenous nurses within um New Zealand Maori nurses to the Canadian landscape nursing introduced it within healthcare system like this is this is um like we have the answers is what I'm saying we are the largest healthcare profession provincially nationally globally our power to affect change within a system is 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 the best of the best like it's so exciting and so um I mean if, if there's any take-home message today I think it's like for for you know community health nursing as a community of nurses to think about you know how do how do each of us have um agency um to disrupt these harms specifically in our area and collectively how do we determine what that's going to look like to model that for the rest of the healthcare system Hi, Dawn. This is Barbara here. Um, thank you so much. I fully agree with um, everything you're saying, and there's a lot of um, conversation going on in the chat. Um, oh, I'm thanking you and, and agreeing with, with these comments. Um, and there's one other question um, I had that uh, popped up in the chat, and I'll just, um, it was just talking about frameworks for action. And um, there was a framework that they had mentioned from one of the community health nursing textbooks. It's a cycle of oppression and called Towards Anti um, Oppression, Anti Racism in Community Health Nursing. Um, it's by um, Elizabeth McGibbon. Um, but I'm just wondering, are there, you know, and that's the part I think that nurses have the hardest time with. And I think about students as well, um, is you know, taking action. And sometimes it's the taking actions also by, you know, not, you know, being a bystander to things as well. Absolutely. So that's one thing we see. Um, but are things that that we can initiate um, or, or, or are, there, are there frameworks that you've recommend, seen that are, that, that would be helpful in that regards to confront um, this and, and make some changes? Yeah, that's a great question. And on a side note, McGibbon's fantastic. I always quote McGibbon in a lot of my work. So great reference um, for folks. Um, yes. But here, is, this is the other thing that I think, though, um, working predominantly in policy, I think 
okay, as we saw, there's an abundance of reports, there's an abundance of general frameworks. And I, I don't think, like, yes, we have to get specific. And I, I said, we should get specific, like in the truth and, and what that means. Um, but I don't think we really need to invent too many new things, right? Like, like the work has been done. I think now it's an adoption to our specific areas. Um, and, and doing the work of, of figuring out what that looks like. Because one thing that I've noticed um, within healthcare in general, right, is like, well, and this is why we have an abundance of them. Everybody loves a good report. Everybody loves a good framework. And part of what I think compels so many to be made is because it feels like action, right? Like it's like research, like it's so important. And yet, research can feel like action. And I was just, um, I think I just posted it on Facebook, but, um, you know, Cindy Blackstock just talked about how, like, um, yes, research is so important, but like, okay, but how do we move beyond that? And, and I think, and I, and I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm, I'm calling myself out just as much as anyone, right? It's just like, I think we dwell in those areas, you know, because, it um, busy work's not the right word, but it it feels productive. It feels like action, and it is a necessary part of it. But it's that translation um, from those frameworks into practice that I think we're now at a place that should be our primary focus. Um, and 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 again, where that's the challenge. It's that knowledge translation. That's that's the, our greatest challenge right now. Um, and it's. Um, you know, shifting culture. Um, and one of my great mentors, Joy Peacock, always, <laughs> she always talked about like that. I mean, culture, that's where the challenge is, right? She has like often on her Facebook or, and she had this on her inner office, this like, it was like no birds allowed sign. And there's like this pigeon or this um, seagull sitting on it. And it's like a bird sitting on the no birds allowed, right? Like, like, like culture is the harder you can have policy but policy is nothing unless culture is is shifted so how do we um yeah lean into that work and I think right now a big part is like I said education and leaning into the truth um and using those guidelines and frameworks that already exist um as as a compass and a guide to now doing the the uncomfortable work and of implementation I'm going to pass on to Donna. Great. I'll, I'll start my video again. Hoping people can see me. I don't know if I'll get back to the slide deck. I can, I can try to do that. Uh, people would just give me half a second here. Um, would it be helpful, Donna, if I stop sharing maybe? Because now I'm looking at the time. We're going to stop anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I stopped it for you. Um, okay, <laughs> Dawn, I just wanted to say thank you for that excellent session this morning. To quote other people, you, you, it's a difficult conversation and difficult for us to be thinking that our profession, our workplaces, our homes may continue to have racism. Um, but as you said, it's the truth. And so I think for me personally, I just want to spend some time in quiet thinking through these concepts today and, and in the coming days. So it's important to take time to reflect. Um, so many, so many, I wrote pages of notes. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. It is, I'm just thinking of of people like Brian Sinclair, Joyce Eshaquan, and Jordan River, the people that have passed away in our healthcare system while we're providing care. And so that definitely that is so, um, so difficult. But the way that you presented the information today in an open, honest way um, is it was just, I was reading the chat and um, I think you created that safe environment for us to share um, in even in terms of the reality that we still all have um, all have work to do. So thank you for that time. And I look forward to the May 10th 
a session as well. I think we had over 100 people attend today. And I suspect that we'll have even more people at the next session. Um, and people may be uh, away with their families today. Um, I also wanted to let people know that we do, I hope I'm screen sharing. Um, we do, uh, there is a book that we have at, um, at CHNC called Caring and Connecting. And this is a book of stories from community health nurses that contributed across Canada. Most of the stories are half a page or, or a couple pages. And it's a great book for people to be able to read. I read it on a plane coming back from a conference and I started crying on the plane. I can't remember which story it was because my copy is in my office but it, um, some nursing professors will read a story to their students at the beginning of a class. So we've got that book on for 50% off. Uh, I also wanted to thank our sponsor today, which is the First Nations Health Authority in British Columbia. We will email certificates and evaluation forms after the second session. So we're not going to do two sets of those, but we're um, going to save our time and do um, that at the same time. Um, there will be more webinars to come, which have been organized by um, Barb Chizzy. And so look forward to those. If you follow us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, you'll be hearing more about those. Um, and I, it's 11 o'clock. So Thank you again to everyone for being here um, on a long weekend. So I hope people have uh, an enjoyable rest of, of the day reflecting on the concepts today. And we'll see you again on May 10th. Thanks everyone for being here.